are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim. Um, but we welcome you all uh, to this church service today. What a wonderful Sabbath it has been. Can I hear amen? amen. Oh, come on. <laughs> All right, that was better. That was better. We'll go ahead and start our uh, praise service this morning with Stand Up. Stand
Father God, we thank you so much for this Sabbath time that we can be together as a church family. We ask that you guide and direct us as we listen to the words of Dr. Bird as he shares with us the message, and that each one of us may be blessed in a very positive way, that we may take it with us when we go back to our homes and share to the world of your soon coming, that we might all go home and be with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Oh, that sounded weak, church. Good morning. We want to welcome you this morning to worship here at our Texaco Convocation. Have you had a blessed week so far? Praise the Lord. I have a couple of announcements I'd like to share with you this morning, and I'm going to see if I can read my handwriting here. First of all, I just need to ask all of the um, Pathfinders and Adventurers to meet on the ground floor of this building. Brother Ricardo needs to meet with you as soon as the worship service is over. He has some instructions for you for later on today. By the way, we just want to thank our Pathfinders who are here and have been helping out. And they'll be collecting our offering today during our worship service. At this time, I'd like to invite Lane Camp to come up. She has some things to share with us from Women's Ministry. Lane, we're glad you're here, and may the Lord bless you on your announcement this morning. Thank you. I was glad when they said unto me, let us come into the house of the Lord. Amen. Isn't it wonderful when God's people get together? Amen. So in just a little over 40 days, I want to give you another opportunity, women, to come together as God's people. The Southwestern Conference, the Southwestern Union, will be holding the Women's Spiritual Retreat. Amen. This is a wonderful opportunity for women and young women to come together and to be even more revitalized in the Lord. We'll have speakers such as Donna Jackson and Carol Wright and Dr. Ella Simmons. A lot of hard work has been put into the development of this program for us. And I just want to invite you to come with me to Frisco, Texas, August 1st through August 4th. There are flyers that some of you may have already received. If not, you can pick some up at the information tables um, downstairs on the first floor. Thank you so much, and I hope to see you there. Amen. A couple of more of announcements we'd like to share with you this morning. It is worship this morning, so I need your help. If you would be kind enough to find that one lovable item called your cell phone, and if you'd be kind enough to either turn it off or to put it on silence or vibrate, we'd really appreciate it because we're here to worship the Lord. Isn't that right? We're here to open the word and to hear his word this morning. So if you'd help us with that, we would certainly appreciate that. I just want to remind you of a couple of special things that are going to be taking place today. We have afternoon seminars. Dr. Derek Morris's seminar will be right here in the Kiva Auditorium at 2 we want you to be here. It, it's on biblical preaching. You, some of you may see a different topic. He says, though, come. He'll be glad to speak with whoever's here. So we want you to be here, those of you who are coming to his seminar. The other seminars are in your handout or in your camp meeting brochure, your convocation brochure. Make sure that you note the details on that. It will tell you where each one are, is being uh, held, who's speaking, and so forth that way. So we just want to make sure of that. Also, this afternoon at 4 o'clock, we have a special program right here in the Kiva Auditorium. It is one that is going to be of some special presentations of music. We would like for you to be here because you're going to gain a rich blessing as you hear what's going on throughout our Texaco Conference. Many ministries that are taking place of all different kinds of things, so you don't want to miss out on that. As soon as that finishes at 5 o'clock, we have a special teacher commissioning service that we would like to have you be here in attendance. You know... Teachers are important people in our lives. In fact, I, one of my best friends told me many years ago that, quite frankly, the two groups of people that probably influence our lives the most are paid the least and thank the least, teachers and preachers. And I said, you know, there's a lot of truth to that. So we hope that you'll be here to help affirm these teachers in this special commissioning service today. In the back, 
There are some books that look like this. There's a limited number. They are free. We'd like for you to have one if you'd like to have one. Just stop by on the way out of the worship service and pick up if it's there. We hope that you'll be able to find it if somebody hasn't beat you to it. We'd like you to have these books. They are a gift, and we hope that you'll appreciate them and, and use them. Last night, I just want to say that we appreciated so very much all of you who helped participate in moving us from our location yesterday to the Kiva Auditorium today. Without your help, this would not have been possible today. So I want to say a huge thank you. We appreciate that so very much. It's nice when the family of God works together. What do you say? Amen. Amen. A couple of other things quickly. We could use some help again this evening as we tear down this facility after the evening meeting tonight. The ABC could also use some help. We would appreciate that. And then one last uh, couple of things here. The after hours uh, downstairs on the ground floor, you may have been able to take advantage of that. They're having a sermon contest, and it's still open to have a person or two uh, have a small sermon that way. 2.45 is the time. The theme is on a chosen people, and you need to speak with Barbara. And she will be the one to help coordinate and make sure that is. But if you'd like to help us with that, we'd really appreciate that. Let me ask you one question this morning. Are you happy this morning? Let me see your hands. I'm not sure I believe you. Do you love the Lord this morning? Yes. Don't put your hands down. Turn to someone near you. Welcome, the, the, welcome them here this morning. Tell them God loves you and so do I. So good to have you here. As we begin worship, we want to invite our quartet to come and help us to be prepared to be in the presence of God. Quartet, if you would come at this time. Escuché que Jesús volverá a serte con gozo esa verdad. La esperanza firme está, pues ahora bien yo sé. No dudemos más, vendrá 
el buen Señor. Su promesa cumplirá, por sus hijos volverá, si confía pronto nuestro rey. That was a blessing, amen? amen. Good morning, everyone, and we're good. It's good to be here together to celebrate the Sabbath day in this beautiful auditorium. It's my privilege today to introduce uh, someone to you that's new to our conference, and it's uh, Elder Phil Robertson. I'd like Elder Robertson to stand, come forward. He's going to call for the offering today. Uh, we have been in the process of looking for a conference treasurer for about two years, and praise God, we now have a conference treasurer. Yeah. <laughs> Elder Chacon has done an able job along with his staff, his treasury staff, taking care of business uh, during this time. But uh, Elder Robertson is uh, uh, on, on staff with us, effective July 1st. His wife, Kathy, is also uh, an accountant and a CPA. Elder Robertson has been a conference treasurer. He's been an auditor and a supervisory auditor for the General Conference Auditing Service. He has also been a, the administrative uh, pastor and a pastor for the Keene Church for 11 years. So we are blessed to have him here. I, I will say this, I said this the other evening for those who were, uh, were here. You know, we've, we've talked to a lot of people who are qualified. We've even issued calls for people who were qualified who got to carry forth the, the job. But I, I can tell you this, that when I talk to him and, and we're praying about it, God impressed me, this is the person that should be here. And I believe more than anything, when God speaks to you, if you're a minister of the gospel, you know when it happens. You know when God speaks to you. Amen? Amen. And I'm sure you do too. And I believe God has called uh, Elder Robertson to come here, and he's going to uh, call for offering this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Elder Stevens. It is a distinct privilege and a great honor for my wife, Kathy, and I to be joining this great Texaco family. Great workers, great administration, awesome members. We can't wait to get to know and, and love you just like we have uh, been blessed in times of service and places where we've been before. And we look forward to what God is going to do yet in the future in this place. And we know that he is just getting started with some phenomenal plans. And we are counting on him to bring it all into fruition according to his will and in his time. So this morning, we'd like to invite you to share in the resourcing of some of that vision and the mission of evangelism. Jesus said to his disciples just before he went back to heaven, go and teach to all nations. All nations includes Albuquerque and Rio Rancho and Las Lunas and El Paso and Rio Doso and Lubbock and Amarillo and all of the areas in the Texaco Conference as well. Your neighborhood your workplace. Evangelism is what we do. It's who we are. Because Jesus said, if you love each other, you will show the world that you're my disciples. And we have been called to make other disciples in his name as well. 
What a great privilege, what a great honor is ours in that mission. So we invite you to join in resourcing that today by sharing in the gifts that God has given you and the offering that will be taken. I'd like to invite those who are going to wait upon us at this time to take their places and let's just bow for a word of prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, our hearts are full of gratitude and praise to you today. Thanking you for all that you do for us, for the way you bless our lives in manifold ways. We are just grateful for all the things that we enjoy from your hand. But more than that, we're grateful for the assurance of salvation, for the fact that we matter to the heart of a loving God and that he's going to live with us forever. We want to be there soon, Lord Jesus. We want all those with whom we've labored and prayed to be part of that grand reunion and glorious homecoming as well. And so we'd ask that you would bless this, mission, this ministry, the mission of evangelism and sharing our faith, our testimony in the gospel of Jesus Christ with our friends, neighbors, and community and our conference territory and around the world. Bless each person here today. Bless these funds that will be given. Expand them. Multiply them. And may they accomplish your will and your work. And we long to see you soon, but until then, Please hold our hearts close to yours. In Jesus' name. It's my privilege to introduce our speaker uh, for this morning. It's Dr. Carlton Bird. And many of you, if you have the Hope Channel, probably have seen him uh, on the uh, television broadcast that comes on uh, early Sabbath morning. He's a speaker for the Breath of Life. He's also the senior pastor at the Oakwood uh, Church in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, but pastor Bird, as uh, he has mentioned here, is a twin. He is also the son of a minister. And I think his grandfather also was a minister, fifth generation Seventh-day Adventist. Now, he likes doing things in twos. He got two uh, majors in college, two master's degrees. He's got one doctoral degree so far. And I've learned something about all great preachers. All great preachers are readers. They read a lot. And if you've got two master's degrees and a doctoral degree, you've read a lot. You wouldn't have to read again, and you've still been reading a lot. But we're really pleased to have him here. He's, a, he's an excellent speaker. In fact, uh, you know, I hear a lot of preachers, and I don't often take notes, but I only have one sermon I took notes on on my iPhone. And that was a sermon he gave at our president's retreat. I'm going to give you that sermon real quick, because he won't give it to you probably. Here's his sermon. I won't give you the text. Think positive thoughts. Hear positive sounds. See positive sights. Speak positive words. Perform positive deeds. 
attend positive places, make positive friends. It's better to be it's better to be better than bitter. Amen. And when I heard that sermon, I thought this man needs to preach in Texaco. So we we welcome him here to preach to us this morning and to celebrate the Sabbath and worship our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, from the Reformation, we have some wonderful things that are given to us. Instead of an altar where the Jesus was sacrificed, this was taken out. And the pulpit was put in to show that here, the word of God is the center. Amen. It's to be preached from there and read from there. So you may want to look in your scripture today, in John, the ninth chapter. And we'll read the first five verses. Speaking of Jesus here. It says, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciple asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in the, his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no man can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Amen. There is power when we come together and worship. But there's even more power when we come together and worship and bow our knee to God. Amen? Amen. This morning, we want to take a few moments to bow our knees to our God, God Almighty. Many of us have many different prayer requests. We've seen God moving in our lives in a variety of different ways. We have issues that we're facing. Maybe it's a health issue. Maybe it's a friend who has a health issue. Maybe it's employment. Maybe it's a familial issue. Let's bring them to the throne of grace. I want to invite you where you are to kneel or to stand or um, however, just to sit, just where, however you feel comfortable to take this time, these moments, to come to the throne of grace and invite God to take charge of the events in our lives. Father, as we come before you this morning, we want to thank you, Lord, that this is your Sabbath that we are here to worship you as our Lord and our God. Father, it's because you created us. It's because you then sent your own son, Jesus, to die on the cross and to pay the price for our sins, that you have redeemed us with a very precious price and brought us back to you. Father, we love you not because we love you, but because you loved us. And you demonstrated in your love, your creative love, your love that would redeem us, the ultimate love. And we can't, can't even begin to fathom just how deep that is and how majestic it is in our lives. But Father, we come humbly before you because you're our creator, our sustainer, you love us, you've moved us back to you. And we know, Lord, that as we come individually and corporately to worship you, Lord, that you are not only something that's just an academic knowledge, but you are very real, very dynamic, very much an active part in our lives. And that your Holy Spirit reaches out to us and touches our hearts and fills us to overflowing so that we not only do we feel your presence, but we know, Lord, that as we follow you, you lead and guide us down paths, Lord, that may be twisted and turned. But Lord, they always, always lead us to victory and success as we follow you. Father, today, as we worship you, as we give honor and glory, we know, Lord, that we have failed you. But we want to thank you, Lord, for not looking at our failure, but for looking at each one of us as an opportunity to demonstrate your love and your grace. That as, Lord, we see you working on our lives, Father, we know that you and you alone are the one who, who has the plan, the best plan. And as we follow it, Lord, 
you, you give us success all the time. Father, we're here to worship you. We're, we're here, Lord, to offer the issues that we have. Each one of us, Lord, has different ones. We want to just take a second or two just to say, Jesus, we give these to you for your honor and glory so that you can demonstrate your power and your strength taking care of each one of them. And then, Father, as we come to worship you, Lord, we invite you to take all the cares out of our hearts, out of, out of our minds. Fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. That as we worship you from our deepest, most intimate parts of our heart, Lord, we may surrender completely to you. And this worship together will be something beautiful for you and your honor and your glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to praise him for all the wonderful things he's done for me. Amen. I've got so much to And so
and sister Tammy, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. If you're happy to be here on God's Sabbath day, let me see you say amen. Praise be to God. I'm grateful to stand here today. I'm unworthy, but I praise God for his grace and his mercy that make me be able to stand here this day and say a word for the Lord. I'm grateful to be here in the great Texaco conference. I'm grateful not only to be here, but that my wife and our children were able to accompany me here. And so I'm going to ask my wife right there, just wave your hand so the folk can see you. Give a hearty amen, everybody. Amen. And our daughters, they are in the children's ministries program, and I know they have been blessed as well with being here with you. We want to thank our conference president, Dr. Pastor Jim Stevens, for his invitation and the warmth that he and his lovely wife have shown to us. We want to thank the officers and also Pastor Sean Robinson. He's kind of been the go-between, if you will, to make sure that everything was in place for us. And we're grateful for the ministry of Pastor Robinson. We're going to get right in the Word of God this morning. And so we invite you, if you would, to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of John. The book of John. Now, the first five verses were read, but I'm going to read a little bit more than five verses. And so I want to invite you to take your Bibles. Go with me to John chapter 9. And we're going to begin reading with verse number 1. Now, I can't see you. I trust you can see me. So I trust you're turning in your Bibles to John chapter 9. Amen, somebody. John chapter 9, verse number 1. The Word of God says to us this Sabbath morning, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin? this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. When night cometh, no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Verse 6. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground, made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay. And he said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him, the blind said, It is not that sat and begged. Some said, this is he. Others said, he is like him, but he said, I am he. Therefore said they unto him, how were thine eyes open? He answered and said, a man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received sight. Then said they unto him, Well, where is he? He said, I know not. They brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said unto them, He put clay upon mine eyes, and I washed and do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. Verse 17, They say unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him, that he opened thine eyes? He said, He is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then doth he now see? 
His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but by what means he now see it? Not. Oh, who hath opened his eyes? We know not. He is of age. Ask him. He shall speak himself. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews, but the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, said his parents, he is of age. Ask him. Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise because we know that this man is a sinner. But then the clincher comes in verse 25. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or not, I know not. But one thing I do know, that whereas I was blind, but now I see. God right now breathe in this auditorium. Make it your sanctuary. God, there are some today that are blind, but through your word and the power of the Holy Ghost, make them see. Hide me behind your cross and forgive me of my sins, and we give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory for what you will do through your word this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you see me now? Now, I must admit, out of all the Jesus miracle stories in the Bible, this is my favorite. It's my favorite for many reasons that I don't have time to tell you all the reasons. But know this, I love this story because I love the end. I love the end and when the man says whether he was a sinner or not, I don't know. Whether he was a prophet, whether he's a preacher, whether he's a priest, whether he's a pastor, I don't know. I don't know where he came from. I don't even know where he is right now. I don't know where he's going. I don't know his family. I don't know if he's a doctor. I don't know if he's a nurse, a dentist, a lawyer, or teacher. All I know is I once was blind. But now I see. There are many illnesses and impairments in our world today. You name it, we have it. Cancer, we have it. Leukemia, we have it. High blood pressure, we have it. Arthritis, we have it. Heart disease, we have it. The inability to talk, we have it. The inability to walk, we have it. The inability to smell, we have it. There are so many diseases, so many dysfunctions that doctors can barely keep track of them all. But out of all the impairments out there, the one thing I know that would be tough for me would be being born blind. To have sight is critical for me. If I couldn't smell, I still would be able to see. If I couldn't touch, I still would be able to see. If I couldn't walk, if I couldn't talk, I still would be able to see. If I couldn't hear, I still would be able to see. Sight is important to me. Do I have a witness in this place? Jesus and his disciples, they're walking through Jerusalem and they see a man who's born blind, a man who's been blind from his birth. This is the only miracle recorded in the Bible that expresses that this impairment existed from this man's birth. Because he's born blind and he's been blind from birth, the natural tendency was to believe that this man or his parents had performed some sin that caused this impairment. Disciples asked Jesus, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents? that he was born blind because there was a Jewish belief that all suffering was punishment for sin. Ellen White says in Desire of Ages that every affliction in Jewish thought was regarded as a penalty of some wrongdoing, either of the sufferer himself or of his parents. According to the Talmud, there was no death without sin and there was no suffering without iniquity. A sick man did not recover from his sickness until all his sins were forgiven him. We shouldn't think it's strange that people would think such a thing because we often describe, ascribe and subscribe to the thought that the wages of sin is death. That you reap what you sow. 
that sin has its retribution. And while we must not ignore these biblical injunctions, we must be careful that we don't pass judgment on people with the improper use of these statements, recognizing that there are hundreds of God's children who suffer and a cause can't be traced to it. Think about Job. Job sought to please God in everything and in every way, but Job still suffered suffered greatly to prove that his faith was in God rather than material things. Which leads to the question, why do bad things happen to good people? Why do the wicked prosper? What did I do wrong to deserve the problems I now face? What have I done wrong? I mean, I return an honest tithe and give a liberal offering, but why are my lights cut off and the person down the street doesn't return tithe, does not even go to church, but yet they have a fine house, fine car, and can go on vacation every year? Why am I a vegetarian? I don't eat fried foods. I exercise every day. I drink eight glasses of water, but yet I'm the one who contracts cancer. And the person down the street drinks, smokes, eats in and everything, and they've got a clear bill of health. Why was I born blind? Now, if this man was blind as a result of his own sin, then he had to have sinned before he was born inasmuch as his blindness existed from birth. But then that couldn't be the case because how could one sin before one had light? So then maybe it was generational. Because the Bible does say that the Lord visits the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and the fourth generation of them that hate him. Yes, there is a thing called generational curses. Children often suffer the consequences of their parents' wrongdoing, but they are not punished for their parents' guilt. Ellen White says, suffering is inflicted by Satan, but it is overruled by God for purposes of mercy. So then why is there sickness? Why is there suffering? The bottom line, friends of mine, is we are fallen people living in a fallen world. Stop blaming yourself for something you had no responsibility in. Stop blaming people for stuff they had nothing to do with. Sometimes bad things happen to good people. Sometimes the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Jesus said, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but as a result of his suffering, the works of God are going to be made manifest in him. In other words, sometimes you have to go through something to get something. You can't have a testimony without a test. There is no battle without the blessing. This man didn't sin, and neither did his parents, but that the works of God might be made manifest in him, which means sometimes you have to go through something so God can get the glory. But I love Jesus. Notice, Jesus did not explain the cause of the man's affliction. Jesus just told them what would be the result. In other words, Jesus says, look, I'm not here to debate with you. I'm not here to debate with you on how he got sick. I'm not here to debate with you or give a prognosis. I'm just here to tell you what I'm getting ready to do. I'm just here to tell you that God's about to be glorified. The man is about to be edified and the devil is about to be terrified. So Jesus spits on the ground. He makes mud, puts mud on the man's eyes. He anoints the man's eyes, and then he says, now go wash in the pool of Siloam. Now imagine you're blind. If you've lost the sense of sight, the other senses that you have kick in, and they're a little sharper than others. You hear this man whom you don't know, you're blind, so you've never seen him. But you hear him spit on the ground, rub the dirt and the spit together to make mud, and then he puts it on your eyes, and he tells you to go wash in a pool somewhere. You would think 
that this man is crazy. Because most times when you're sick and you're trying to get well, you expect to do things that make you better, not make you feel worse before you get better. Spitting in the ground does not seem to make things better. When you have a headache and you take an aspirin or you take medicine, it's supposed to get you better before it gets you worse. But somebody knows that sometimes things get worse before they get better. In fact, I've learned in my life that better is relative. Better is how you view it because your worst may be somebody's best and somebody's best may be your worst. I can't explain this morning why Jesus spits on the ground and makes medicine mud out of his saliva. I can't explain why Jesus sends the man to the pool of Siloam when he healed so many other people with just one word or one touch. Just like I can explain why Naaman had to go dip in the muddy Jordan seven times. I can't explain why a man had to come down through a roof in order that he might get healing. I can't explain why Jairus' daughter had to die in order for Jesus to bring her to life again. I can't explain why Lazarus had to die only for Jesus to resurrect him again. It leads me to this conclusion that sometimes God's way of healing is not your chosen way of healing. Sometimes God's way of bringing you out may not be the way you would have chosen to come out. I've learned sometimes you have to have mud on your face. Sometimes you have to be laughed at. Sometimes you have to come through a roof, but you ought to just be thankful that God brought you out. Hallelujah, somebody. Can we be real today? It's easier to love God when God does what we want. But what about the times when God doesn't do what we want? It's easy to praise God when the sun is shining, the birds are singing, the money is flowing. But what about the times when the rain is falling, the lions are growling, your money is funny, your change is strange, and your credit can't get it? What about those times when you're sick and you can't get well? What about those times when you've got more moth than you do money? What about those times when you're blind? Let me tell you something. In these difficult times, that's when you learn how to trust God. That's when you learn to have faith in God, where you understand he may not come when you want him, but he's always right on time, where he says, my ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts, which means God is God. God is sovereign. God can deviate from the conventional acceptable methods that are so easily misunderstood by the majority. God is not limited by anything or anyone. God touched a leper. God spoke through a donkey. God provided air conditioning in a fiery furnace. God had more medicine in his coat than any doctor anywhere. God took a dead girl by the hand and raised that girl from the dead. God stood in front of Lazarus' grave and called him out. God stood over Peter's mother-in-law and rebuked her raging fever. God spoke to the winds. God spoke to the waves. God said, peace, be still. God laid down his life and took it up again. God can do what he wants, when he wants, where he wants, how he wants, and he doesn't have to ask you and me for permission to do what he wants. God is God, and the way God brings you out may not be the way you want to come out, but if you're like me, you're just thankful you're out. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You have to have faith. You have to trust in God. You have to have faith in God. Faith is believing what you cannot see. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It is impossible to please God without faith. God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Faith, you have to have faith in God. Sometimes you have to believe God for something for which you have no point of reference. Think about it. 
if a man had been born with eyesight and then gone blind, at least then he would have had a point of reference of what it would have been like to see. But you can't miss what you've never had. And because he was born blind, he has to believe God for something for which he has no point of reference. He has to have faith. So all of a sudden, the people in the city see this former blind man who can now see. And so they begin to ask, is this the same man we once knew? No, it can't be the same man. It just looks like him. And then someone else would know it has to be him. It is him. So they asked him, how did you get your eyes open? How are you now able to see? Who did this for you? He says, a man named Jesus did this. I've never seen him in my life. When he healed me, he just put mud on my eyes. Told me to go wash in the pool of Siloam. I did what he told me to do. And now I see. I didn't see him when he told me what to do. I just went and washed like he told me. Well, where is he now? I don't know where he is. So you mean to tell me you're healed. You don't know who healed you and you don't know where he is, just forget it. And so now they get mad because the man won't answer them and can't answer him. They take him to the Pharisees and they'll get the Pharisees to get an answer out of the man. Let me pause right here. Why can't the people just be happy for the man? Why can't the people just rejoice in his healing. Why can't the people just praise God for his healing? No, they've got to know who healed him, when he healed him, why he healed him, and how he healed him. They just can't be happy for the man, so they got to go drag the Pharisees into this, and that's just like people. I've learned firsthand, even in ministry, that everybody does not joy in your success. In fact, the best moment in your life often produces the greatest moment of jealousy and envy in somebody else's life. Tell the truth, shame the devil. That's a southern slang we say. There's nothing that gets on your nerves more than seeing somebody do what you've always wanted to do or get what you've always wanted to get. But as the young people say, don't hate the player. Hate the game. Learn to be a cheerleader because if God is blessing somebody else, God must be in the neighborhood and it's just a matter of time before God blesses you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Let me tell you something. People who try to block you, people who try to hate on you, people who try to discourage you, they have no idea that actually they're blessing you. The Bible says that God will make your enemies your footstool, which means your enemies will be placed under your feet, which means the haters and your enemies are actually pouring the concrete that you're going to walk on. Hallelujah, somebody. But here go the Pharisees. You know them. Here they are. Can't sing. Can't smile. Can't speak. Can't shake hands. Can't do this. Can't do that. Find fault in everything. Here go the Pharisees. The Pharisees hate on the man and begin now to question the man too. They want to know, how did you receive your sight? They want to know who healed him, and they want to know what the man believes about Jesus. So they tell the man that Jesus could not possibly be from God because he broke the religious law and healed on the Sabbath. Verse 16. This man is not of God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. How can a sinner do such miracles? But the real deal, another lesson, 
the real deal, friends of mine, is that the Pharisees are mad because they weren't the source of the man's healing and couldn't claim rights to it. Think about it. If Jesus had sent the man to the Pharisees instead of to the pool, they would have been fine. No discussion, no debate, no questioning, but because Jesus didn't use them, because Jesus didn't ask them, because Jesus didn't consult them, they had a problem, and that's just like some of us. When we're not consulted on a decision, when we're not asked about a decision, when we're not in the loop, when we're not a part of the so-called in crowd, and I'm still trying to figure out who is the in crowd, when we are not a part of that, there's a problem. And so what people will try to do is they will try to minimize you because they think it will maximize them. And that's why I love me some Jesus. Because Jesus has a way of using people that other folk don't. But you can't get credit for their healing and their deliverance. This man is not of God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. So how can he do miracles? Now, while they appeared wonderfully zealous for the observance of the Sabbath, by the same token, they were planning murder that same day. How hypocritical. Sounds like some of us. I'll return my tithe and offering, but I'm as mean as I want to be. I'm a vegetarian, but I will sleep around with any and everybody. To heal the sick man was not a breach of the divine law of the Sabbath. In fact, finding fault with Jesus for such a breach, the Pharisees, in fact, showed their ignorance of a law they were supposed to observe. Remember, friends of mine, it was Jesus when he began his ministry who healed the man with the withered hand who told the Pharisees early on that it was lawful to do good on the Sabbath day. The Pharisees totally missed the point that the man's healing was a miracle. Ellen White says they were more than ever filled with hatred for the miracle had been performed on the Sabbath day. Don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Are you so caught up in legalism that you forget love? Are you so caught up in the religion of Jesus that you don't have a relationship with Jesus? Are you so caught up in reciting the 23rd Psalms that you really don't know the shepherd? Are you so caught up that you're in the sanctuary but you don't have God's spirit? That you know the Lord's prayer but you really don't know the Lord? So the Pharisees, they can't get an answer from the man. So the Pharisees go to his parents. That's the next lesson. That's just like some people. They don't think that your miracle is real. They think your miracle is phony, that it's fake, and that it's false. You see, I don't know about you, but when I fall on my knees on Sabbath morning, and when we pray a corporate intercessory prayer, that we're praying for ourselves and that we're praying for others, friends, I'm not doing it out of form or fashion. But I'm believing that God is going to do just what he says he's going to do. That if we ask, if we seek, if we knock, that God will find and he will open the doors for us. When I believe that we come here for prayer and we're asking God to remove cancer, I believe God's going to do it. When we come here and we ask in faith, God, mend our families, mend our marriages, mend our children. In faith, I'm believing that. But there are some people that think your miracle is faulty, fake, and false. They try to falsify your miracle. Ellen White says, like Pharisees, they'd rather deny the evidence of their own senses than admit they were wrong. Somebody knows. You can't explain the goodness of God. You cannot explain the miracle working power of God. You cannot explain the awesomeness of God. And you know what? You don't have to. Because that's what a miracle is. A surprising and welcome event that is not explainable by natural or scientific laws, which means it can only be the divine. I don't know about you, friends of mine, but if I were to testify just for a minute today, 
There are some things in my life that all I can say is, look at God. Anybody know what I'm talking about? That it was just God. You can't even explain it. It was just God. Anybody still believe in miracles? Anybody believe that God still has miracle working power? Woke you up this morning. That's God. Started you on your way. That's God. Put food on your table today. That's God. Gave you the job you weren't applying for. The job just found you. That's God. The tumor in your body, instead of growing, it's now shrinking. That's God. Sent you a refund check in the mail and you weren't even expecting it. That's God. Put a $20 bill in your hand from somebody at church and you needed it and they didn't even know your situation. That's God. Brought your child back to the Lord. Off the street doing any and everything. That's God. I can't explain the goodness of God. I just know that my God is good. And it's good to know Jesus. That Jesus is good. The Pharisees don't believe the man was healed. They don't believe him. So they now question the young man's parents. And the good thing is, if you follow the story, they've gone from talking to the man to now talking to the multitude to now talking to his parents. And what the Pharisees don't realize is that the more they talk, the greater the publicity they're giving the works and miracles of Jesus. That the more they talk, the more people start talking about Jesus. They think they're hurting things, but they're actually helping things. And so while they're fussing, while they're complaining, while they're trying to start all this mess and the confusion, the former blind man is over here saying, look, a sunrise. Look, a sunset, a river, a, a mountain. And so the Pharisees see they're not having any way with the man or with the people. They go to the man's parents and they say, is this your son? Is this the one you say was born blind. How is it that he can see now? Trembling and fearful because they were afraid, the Bible says, they would be put out the church. His parents answered, we know he's our son. We know he was born blind. But how he can see or who opened his eyes we don't know. But ask him. He's of age. He'll speak for himself. I wish I had time to do that justice, that he'll speak for himself. Poor parents, fear of being put out of the church, led them to cover up the truth. They're afraid, so they're going to pass the buck. They shifted all responsibility from themselves to their son. So they'd rather lie than be this fellowship from the church. But let me tell you something. I'd rather be in a storm with Jesus than standing in sunshine with man. Getting no help from his parents. The Pharisees go back to the man a second time. Quit giving this man credit. You ought to give God the praise. This man that you're talking about is a sinner. But then comes my favorite part of the story. It's the man's response. The man's response reveals remarkable shrewdness. He refuses to argue about whether Jesus was a sinner or not. He refuses to argue where about where Jesus came from. He just bases his testimony on indisputable evidence. The man says, look, you talked to me once, you've gone to the people, you've gone to my parents, let me settle this once and for all. I don't know where the man came from. I don't know if he's a saint or if he's a sinner. I don't know if he goes to church 
or not. I don't know what school he went to. I don't know if he went to Harvard. I don't know if he went to the University of New Mexico. I don't know if he went to the University of Texas. I don't know if he went to Loma Linda, Southwestern, Oakwood, or Andrews. I don't know. All I know is I was blind. But now, I see. I don't know if he knows President Obama. I don't know if he knows Governor Perry. I don't know if he knows Governor Martinez. All I know is I once was blind, but now I see. I don't know what the conference committee said. I don't know what the church board said. I don't know what the board of elders said. I don't even know what you said. All I know is, y'all don't hear me, that I was blind, but now I see. All I know, friends, is I went to bed last night. Slept six or seven hours, but the alarm clock didn't do it, but God woke me up this morning. All I know is that I, they said to somebody that they had stage four cancer. They told that individual to say their goodbyes. They told the person there was nothing else that they could do, but that was three years ago. The cancer has now gone into remission. All I know is for somebody you've been talked about. For somebody else, you've been criticized. For somebody else, you've been hated on, you've been misunderstood. But take a look at you now. Well, I don't know whether he's a saint or sinner. I don't know where he came from. I'm not here to debate about his messiahship. I'm not here to debate or argue about how I got healed, when I got healed, where I got healed, or on what day I got healed. All I know is, I once was blind, but now I can see. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Can you see me now? I used to walk with a cane. I used to walk with a seeing-eyed dog. I used to be led by somebody. But can you see me now? I once was blind, but now I see. I once used to be out on that street corner. I once used to be living it up. I once used to be gambling my life away. But can you see me now? I'm a deacon in God's church. I'm an elder in God's church. I'm an usher in God's church. I once was blind, but now I see, and now I've got a right to praise him. And when we come into the house of God, when we come into God's presence, we ought to lift holy hands and worship him. I don't care what's going on in your life. We ought to lift holy hands and worship him because you may not be where you want to be, but praise God, you're not where you used to be. Your car may be barely running, but praise God, you're not walking. Understand, you may not have the house you want, but praise God, you've got a roof over your head. You may not have any money in your pocket, but at least you've got some food on your table. You've had some good days. You've had some bad days. You've had some hills to climb. But when you look around and you think things over, all of your good days outweigh your bad days. Don't you complain. Come away from the complaint counter and come to the claim window. Today, where are my real people at? Where are the real worshipers that know if it had not been for the Lord on my side? Where would I be? Praise God in the sanctuary. Praise God in the firmament of his power. Praise God for his mighty acts. Praise God according to his excellent greatness. Praise God for the sound of the trumpet, the psaltery in the harp, the cymbal in the dance, the string instruments and organs. Praise God with the loud cymbal. Praise him with the high sound of cymbals. Let everything that hath breath 
pray ye the Lord. I once was blind, but now I see. When a person is arrested, the police read them their Miranda rights. You know them. You have a right to remain what? Anything you say can be held against you in a court of what? You have a right to an attorney. If you cannot afford one, one will be provided by the what? By the state of state or by the court. Amen. Sound like some of y'all got some experience with this. Praise God. Today, I want you to understand something. That when God has been good to you, when God has opened your eyes, when God has given you sight, you don't have a right to remain silent. Nobody, nothing should inhibit your testimony. Nothing should prohibit your praise. And if the Lord has done something for you, every now and then, you've got to say something. If the Lord has picked you up, turn you around, sometimes you've got to say something. If the Lord has been your bridge over troubled waters, sometimes you have to say something. If the Lord has helped you raise those children by yourself, Sometimes you've got to say something. If you have been blind and the Lord has given you sight, you've got to say something. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Can you see me now? The man didn't know who he was. He just knew his name was Jesus. And I don't know about you, but I love to call his name. I love to call the name Jesus. Demons tremble at the name of Jesus. Satan is fickled at the name of Jesus. Jesus came down from the bosom of the Father to the bosom of a woman. Jesus put on humanity so that we can put on divinity. Jesus became the son of man that we might become the sons of God. Jesus came from heaven where the heavens never, where rivers never freeze, winds never blow, flowers never fade, and no one is ever sick. Jesus, in infancy, he started a king. In boyhood, he puzzled wise men. In manhood, he ruled the course of nature. He walked upon the billows, hushed the sea to sleep, healed multitudes without medicine, and made no charge for his service. Never founded a college, but all the schools in the world could not hold enough books written about it. Jesus. Never marched an army, drafted a soldier, never fired a gun. No, no leader has made more volunteers who have under his orders made rebels stack arms of surrender without even a shot being fired. Jesus, the star of astronomy, the rock of geology, the lion and the lamb of zoology, the healer of all diseases. Great men have come and gone, but he lives on. Herod could not kill him. Governments could not silence him. Money could not buy him. Satan could not seduce him. Hell could not handle him. Death could not destroy him. And the grave could not hold him. Because he's my Jesus. And just like the blind man, we've got to go tell it everywhere we go. Tell it to everybody that Jesus was born. That Jesus was reared in a carpenter shop. That as a child he amazed great preachers. Tell him he was baptized in the muddy Jordan. Tell him that he healed the sick, raised the dead. 5,000 souls he fed. Tell him when you're sick, he heals you. That when you're hungry, he feeds you. That when you're naked, he clothes you. That when you're down, he picks you up. When you're out, he reaches and pulls you back in. That when you're blind, he causes you to see. And today I'd rather have Jesus than anything. I'd rather 
have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather have Jesus. I once was blind. But because of Jesus, now I see. You can have the world. Forgive me, Jesus. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches. I love Jesus as old. Eyes are closed. Father, once were blind, but now we see. And we'd rather have Jesus than anything. God, the man in John chapter 9, he 
He needed a miracle. He needed one of sight. Born blind, had been to doctors, been to physicians. They did all that they could, but seemed like nothing did any good. So he needed Dr. Jesus. Today, June the 22nd, oh God. You're a Texaco convocation. For somebody, it might not be the miracle of sight, but somebody today, God, needs a miracle. Perhaps they have come from far. They may have come even from near in this city today. But God, they need a miracle. For somebody, the miracle is physical. They've got a sickness, there's a diagnosis that has been placed on them, and God, they need Dr. Jesus to heal them. For someone else, God, the miracle they need is financial. Times are tough. They trusted you. But God, if they don't get a financial miracle soon, they're not. But then, Lord, there's someone who needs a miracle in their home. We come to church and we, we put on a good show. We have a good image. We look nice. We dress nice. We smile. We say happy Sabbath. But internally, God, somebody is hurting right now. Somebody, when they leave this convocation, they're on their way back to their city. And they're on their way to divorce court. God, we need a miracle for them right now. Somebody's son, daughter, grandson, granddaughter. They were brought to Sabbath school. They were brought to Pathfinders. They were even brought to camp, camp meeting, convocation. And they wandered from you. But God, we're praying for a miracle. That they would come back home. And so God, I dare not close this service. Without allowing men, women, and even if there are boys and girls in this auditorium right now, oh God. They need a miracle. And they need it right away. And God, I'm going to now make two appeals. And God, this first appeal right now is as you speak through the power of your Holy Spirit to your people. For those individuals that God need a miracle and they need it right now, they need it, oh God, I need them to stand right now. To acknowledge, oh Lord, I've tried all I could do. But God, now I'm giving it to you. For somebody, it's not blindness. For somebody, it's financial. To somebody else, it's not financial, it's sickness. For somebody, it's family, but whatever it is, you need a miracle and you need it right now. Heaven sees, heaven records. Now, God, appeal number two. In the stillness of this hour, somebody today was blind. But through the power of your Holy Spirit, they can see that this is your remnant church. That God, we are your remnant people. That we love Jesus and because we love him, we want to keep his commandments. And so God, somebody sees that light. And so they want to join and be a part of your remnant people. God, they may be already standing. God, they may be sitting. But God, you know who they are. You know where they are. And God, I want you to send them right here to the front today because I want to pray for them. You're here. We pause in this prayer. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you. And he's saying you were blind, but now you see. And now you need to walk in the light, the beautiful light of Christ Jesus. You need to join and be a part of God's remnant commandment keeping church, be it through baptism for somebody else. You may have been baptized before, but not baptized unto the light and the truth that you now understand from the word of God. And it's time for you to be rebaptized for someone else. You've fallen off. You're not where you need to be in it, God. God, 
God speak to you? You were blinded. But now you can see. So I invite you. Give me your hand, but give Jesus Christ your heart and make the greatest decision that you will ever make in your life. Baptism. Rebaptism. You want to join God's grim and commandment keeping church because you love Jesus. I want you to meet me down right here, right now. You're not worried about what anyone else will say about you because the reality is there's no one in here that has a heaven or hell for you. There's only one name by where which we can be saved, and that's the name of Jesus. And God, through the power of his Holy Spirit, is calling you to Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ crucified right now. So whoever, wherever, however, just come. You'll get back home and someone will say, well, what happened to you? How are you now healed? What happened? What did you hear? What happened? Where are you doing? Who did it? You say, I don't know. I just once was blind. But now, I see. I want you to meet me right down here. I want to pray for you today. I want you to come right now. God is speaking. God is moving. Jesus is calling you today. For someone, this may be your last convocation. While you yet have the opportunity, even so come. I once was blind, but now, Join hands together here. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. It's bowed. We're going to pray, and even as I pray, whosoever will, let him, let her, even come. Don't go back to Lubbock, Abilene, El Paso, Hobbs, Las Cruces, or Santa Fe, or even in Albuquerque the same way you came. It would be a travesty to hear all this good singing Take in all this good word through workshop and through preaching and go back the same way. I once was blind, but now I see. If you're here today one more time, whosoever will, Let him come. God, this day, we thank you for stopping by this place. And God, your people who are standing in the name of Jesus seal their decisions right now. The people who are standing all over this auditorium, which you have made your sanctuary, God, they stand because they need a miracle in their life. God, you said in your word, we have not because we ask not. But you said anything we ask in Jesus' name. If we just believe, it shall be done. So in Jesus' name, 
heal the sick. In Jesus' name, put that cancer in remission. In Jesus' name, lower somebody's blood pressure, oh God. In the name of Jesus, oh God, send a financial blessing to somebody right now. God, in the name of Jesus, stop that procession into divorce court. Be with that man, that woman, that husband, that wife, and mend that marriage in the name of Jesus. But then, Lord, for our children, our sons, our daughters, our grandchildren, God, they've wondered from you, and Lord, they're into some stuff that we can only imagine that they're in. But God, you have a way. And you have a way, oh God, of touching them and turning them around. God, you have a way of sending your Holy Spirit to allow them, to allow us to come to ourselves. Bring us to ourselves. Bring our children, our grandchildren to themselves and bring them to you, oh God. Our God, the individuals who've come down, our sons for baptism, rebaptism. Some, oh God, they want to join your commandment keeping remnant church because they love you and they want to keep your commandments. God, seal their decisions right now in the name of Jesus. And the Lord, save us. Save us. God, I don't want to be a castaway. God, I don't want to preach this word and, and, Lord, talk about this word and be lost. God, save us. Save us by the same gospel we seek to share with others. And then when we get to heaven, when we study war no more, when we sit at your welcome table and feast from milking honey, We'll be able to say, saved by grace and spared by mercy. Love you. We thank you. We praise you. And thank you for opening our eyes that we might see. In Jesus' name. And for his sake we pray. seated. I invite you once more to bow your heads with me as we pray. Holy Spirit, we are thankful. We thank you for ministering the word to our spirits this morning. For the proclamation of this gospel good news. Jesus has been seen. And when Jesus is lifted up, all men will be drawn unto him. And so, Father, in being here, in the manifestation of your presence here with us, may we go forth from this place, you abiding with us still. And go forth proclaiming and testifying as to the goodness of the Lord and what he has done in our lives. And may we share it and never hesitate and never cease in proclaiming the good news of this gospel. For these things we pray, giving you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.